Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, and we are pleased to host this webinar uh, today with Colonel Keith Nightingale, who will discuss both his book and his uh, own memories of just another day in Vietnam. Colonel Nightingale grew up in a small town in California. He attended Claremont Men's College and later joined ROTC. Upon graduation, he was commissioned in the regular Army as an infantryman. After completing jump school and ranger school, he was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. There, he decided to make the Army his career. Colonel Nightingale served two tours in Vietnam with Airborne and Ranger, both American and Vietnamese units. He commanded an Airborne Battalion and later the Ranger Brigade. He was a member of the Arraigned Hos Rescue Hostage Attempt in 1981 and served with several classified organizations. He was the assault force commander in both Grenada and Panama and managed the Department of Defense counter drug support operations in Latin America. After 9-11, Colonel Nightingale served as a principal FAA Sky Marshal training program and also provided court, corporate and technical scientific support to the City of New York Police Department and Fire Departments as part of the 9-11 site recovery programs. In 1993, Colonel Nightingale retired from the Army and accepted a job offer with SAIC to assist in their various technologies for border control and drug screening. At SAIC, he became a high-risk coordinator for the more than 2,000 employees of that company served to, uh, sent to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Nightingale has received many honors and awards through his career, including the Defense Superior Service Medal, three Legions of Merit, five Defense Meritorious Service Medals, Humanitarian Service Medal, and four Bronze Stars for Valor and the Vietnamese Medal of Honor. He is a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm um, ready to be interred now with my eulogy, thank you. I know. Um, this talk today is about your service in Vietnam uh, but before we get to Vietnam, a little bit about your background. Why did you enter the service? Uh, it's been a family tradition from literally the time of the pilgrims. Uh, all the males in the family have served in the military in our various conflicts. Uh, my great-grandfather uh, died at Hilton Head as a uh, officer in the uh, first Rhode Island uh, volunteer organization. Uh, my great, great uncle was uh, with Buford's Cavalry at Gettysburg. Uh, my grandfather served as a ambulance driver in France at Verdun before we entered the war. My great uncle was uh, a, uh, awarded a DSC as a doctor in the First World War in the First Division, the only doctor to receive a Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, my father served uh, in China and then later in Korea. So uh, my joining the Army through ROTC was never a question. I knew I was going to do it. I just didn't know if I was going to follow it as a career. Uh, once I got in, it was clear that we were going to go to Vietnam, and if that was the case as a professional officer, I wanted to be with the very best. Uh, therefore, I signed up for Airborne and Ranger and asked for the 82nd, and I got it. Uh, and while at the 82nd, uh, I received my orders to Vietnam as an advisor. Uh, and I went to the military assistance training and advisory school okay. at Fort Bragg uh, before I deployed. While you were with the 82nd, uh, what were your memories of the unit at the time, their leaders, and especially the NCOs uh, in the 82nd back in? Well, that was a real professional education. Uh, when I joined the 82nd as 2nd Lieutenant Nightingale in 19. 65, 66. Uh, the place was uh, full of World War II and Korean War vets, both officers and NCOs. Uh, the platoon sergeants, first sergeants, sergeant majors were all two, three, four-star uh, combat jumpers. 
my battalion commander jumped into St. Mary Glees. Uh, it was just, you know, they were had a tremendous amount of combat experience. And a lot of the vets who had retired would come back and just kind of wander through the barracks and talk. We had the uh, Friday afternoon beer call to the rear of the company uh, street. And these guys would just come out and start talking about their experiences and what it meant to be uh, a officer or an NCO or a PFC in the 82nd Airborne. Uh, and it was there I really learned the strength of the non-commissioned officer is the core of everything. Uh, it was very clear to me that any unit depended on the quality of its NCOs. Officers, to a degree, were relevant. The NCOs were crucial. Uh, so I, I hope that answers your question, but that was my professional education at the very beginning. Okay, but you say you, you knew you were going to go to Vietnam. It was just a matter of when. Uh, but then in, instead of going to a, uh, a standard infantry unit, you wind up being sent to in, in an advisory role. Was that your choice? Uh, uh, no, I didn't get to vote, actually. <laughs> uh, the orders just came down. Uh, you, will be, you will be assigned to MACV as an in an advisory capacity, specific orders to be determined. Uh, knowing the system and at the recommendation of my battalion commander, I wrote a letter to the senior advisor of the uh, Vietnamese Airborne Brigade uh, and gave him my resume along with a recommendation and asked that I be assigned to the Airborne Brigade. Uh, so you understand the structure at that moment in time, and this is 1966. Uh, there were three what you would call elite Vietnamese organizations, the Vietnamese Airborne, Marines, and Rangers. Uh, these always had the very best of the advisory corps and were considered the best of the Vietnamese military. Though in time, it was clear to me there were other units of equal quality, but they just didn't get the credit. Uh, a short, short answer is I got a letter back assigning me to the Airborne Brigade and uh, giving me my orders to land at Tonsonu and go to the Airborne Brigade headquarters for personnel processing. And this Any was in, before you showed up uh, in Vietnam? Say that again. Any additional schools before you showed up in Vietnam? Uh, yes. Uh, the MATA course was sort of loose and not particularly useful other than kind of a basic skim of culture and issues within the country. Uh, because I was going to be an advisor, they sent me to the Defense Language Institute at Monterey for six weeks for Vietnamese. And that was extraordinarily important. Uh, you know, we have these SFABs they're developing today. I can only say that language is a huge portion uh, of the ability to effectively advise. Uh, the language training I got was absolutely crucial. Once I got to the battalion, uh, the officers spoke English. Virtually all of the troops did not, other than just a smattering of understanding. Uh, so you said, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You, okay. you said that uh, initially you were going to go to the, uh, the airborne unit. When did you find out you're going to be assigned to the Rangers? Yeah, well, I, I landed at Tonsonude, and this is in April of 1967. Uh, and I went over to the processing center with my letter from the Airborne Brigade. They said, great, uh, stay where you are. We'll pick you up in the afternoon, get your uniforms, blah, 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 blah. Well, in the course of that afternoon, uh, I got a hurried phone call back from the Airborne Brigade that said, hey, we have a change of plans here. Uh, there's been several Vietnamese ranger units virtually decimated, and you're going to be uh, transferred from the Airborne Brigade 
to the Ranger Brigade. Thank you very much. Uh, so I then went through the processing, uh, got on a uh, helicopter at Tonstanut and was flown to Swan Lock, Vietnam, which was about uh, 60 miles north and east of Benoit, where I was met by the uh, Ranger Battalion Senior Advisor, Captain Al Shine, and I joined the 52nd Ranger Battalion. Uh, what did you was, know of their history? Uh, zero <laughs> at that time. Uh, I very quickly learned they were a really good organization. Uh, they had been awarded a U.S. Presidential Unit Citation uh, for the rescue of uh, Lieutenant uh, Robert Q. Williams, the Medal of Honor winner at a Special Forces camp. Uh, the battalion, the 52nd at that time, the executive officer, then Captain Hep, was the acting battalion commander, uh, and he was now the full-time battalion commander of the 52nd. Okay. Uh, th this is a picture actually of the advisory team that I joined. Uh, this is after our action at Swan Lock. That's myself on the left, Captain Shine, uh, Platoon Sergeant Swires, and Spec 4 Garrett. Uh, this was the total uh, advisory team at that moment. The normal TOE was six. We only had four. Uh, Garrett, Swires, and myself uh, both just joining uh, Captain Shine. I think I think the next one, uh, Swires. This is, this, this is Platoon Sergeant Swires uh, out in the bush. Uh, he was from Missouri, uh, a, a Korean War vet, uh, superb professional soldier. Uh, got a lot of education from him. Okay. Um, we go down, and I guess this is another, uh, some of the soldiers from the 52nd that you had? Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, this is post uh, the action at Sui Long. Uh, okay. These are some of the troops. You'll notice that they're uh, essentially not v uh, ethnic South Vietnamese. Uh, the 52nd, as most Ranger battalions, was filled with what you would call the, uh, the junk of society. Uh, these were Nungs, Chams, Moton Yards, uh, Chinese, uh, the lower end spectrum of the South Vietnamese population. They were in this for life and they had a very karmic attitude. Uh, they knew they were gonna die in that battalion and they were superb professionals. They never allowed, uh, call it risk or fear, to be part of their equation. Uh, they were just incredible soldiers uh, throughout the ranks. And, uh, you know, I'm here today because of the qualities that they had. You spoke very highly of this next person. Ah, this is Major Wynn Hepp. He was perhaps the greatest single leadership icon that I've had in my military career. Uh, the Vietnamese military was consistently uh, disparaged and downgraded by our media and by uh, troops that were not exposed to them. This was an incredible combat leader. He was also extremely concerned about the professional education of Lieutenant and later Captain Nightingale. Uh, he had uh, watched his father executed in North Vietnam as a village chief under the French colonial rule, uh, shot by the Viet Minh. Uh, he was taken south in 1954 and joined the French colonial military and went to the uh, officer school at Delac. Uh, he, of course, was segued into the new South Vietnamese army when the French went away. Uh, he was very uh, rigid in his beliefs that the purpose of the government was to kill communists. Uh, 
Uh, he was not a politician. He was totally incorruptible. Uh, he was pretty well disliked by the senior South Vietnamese military because he was so unbending. Uh, every command he received, company, battalion, and group, was simply because of his incredible combat capabilities. Uh, he taught uh, Captain Shine and myself, probably the most we ever learned about how to be a leader. Uh, he was here, just an incredible human being. Here you have, I think, Captain Shine along with Yeah, the, this yeah. is in, uh, down near Kuchi. Uh, that is uh, Major Hep on the right with a cigarette and uh, Captain Shine sitting next to him. Um, you talk about the quality of these these Ranger, Marine, and Airborne units. How do they compare? Why, what made them so much better than a standard uh, Vietnamese unit? Well, I would say, first of all, there a number of standard Vietnamese units were very good by any standards. Uh, you know, I saw both the U.S. and the Vietnamese units at the height of the U.S. quality, if you would, 67, 68, during Tet, and then later in 70, 71. And there were a number of Vietnamese uh, units that were extremely good and would match with any U.S. unit. For example, the 1st Infantry Division up in I Corps. Uh, I worked with them in 70, 71. They were totally professional met any standard that the U.S. military would have. Uh, the 5th Vietnamese Cav, which we had in uh, Swan Lock and Three Corps, very, very good. Uh, there were a number of units throughout Vietnam that were good that never got the credit for it. Uh, the issue with the Airborne Marine and Rangers, uh, I think, had a couple parts to it. The first was that uh, they were stocked with really first quality advisors. Uh, the, they were a plum assignment for, if you had to be a Marine advisor, you went to the Marine Brigade. If you were in the professional airborne, you went to the Airborne Brigade. Ditto Rangers. So they always got pretty much the first cut of the advisory uh, personnel at both officer and NCO level. The larger units did not. Uh, Mill percent, the military personnel center, the assignments folks, always said advising was, in, was a very important priority, but it, they never really gave it to them. Uh, always TOE troop command uh, took precedent over any advising. And so after a period of time, uh, the advisory program became as much one of uh, personnel in present uh, as going after the very best people available for the job. Uh, and I think that you, hurt a lot of Vietnamese units. You froze halfway, uh, halfway through there. You were saying no person, and then all of a sudden your, your um, audio froze. Okay, I was just saying that mil percent, despite what they said, did not treat advisory assignments the same way they treated TOE assignments. Uh, in many cases, uh, whatever officer or NCO happened to be left, they would send to an advisory role whether or not that person either wanted to go there or was fit for it in terms of personality. When you look at the, the Vietnamese units, you say they in many cases were equal to a, an American unit. What were they lacking that the Americans provided? Uh, number one, they were lacking consistency. Uh, a lot of officers in the Vietnamese military were assigned to positions based on either political reliability or uh, loyalty to whoever the senior general was in charge rather than their professional competency. 
you would have nodes of competency, say within a brigade or a battalion, but then it would fritter away. Uh, this was particularly the case at the higher levels. Uh, in many cases, for example, our own, the 18th Arvin at Squanlock, uh, the general was selected because he would not take risks. In other words, he would not take the unit to the field and risk getting people killed. He always sent the 52nd to do the work so he could get the statistical credit without having to actually expose his people. And that was pretty endemic throughout the country. Uh, there were some units that simply by their environment had to fight, like the 1st Division up in i -Corps. Uh Others could afford to uh, sit in their base camps and uh, be thankful that the U.S. forces at that time were the ones that were out in the field. Well, if these units were so good, what did you bring, what did your advisory team bring uh, to the unit that they couldn't get necessarily from their own forces? Well, I want to say that the term advisory is somewhat inappropriate. Uh, neither Captain Shine or I were going to advise Major Hep on how to fight a war. What we did, and I think what most advisors did, was they brought in everything the U.S. had. We basically were the forward observers for U.S. artillery, for tactical air, for helicopter gunships, did all the coordination, joint coordination with U.S. At that time, joint U.S.-Vietnamese operations were very common and popular. What the advisor did is he provided coordination and liaison with the U.S. unit to ensure that both the U.S. and the Vietnamese were in sync. He brought in all of the U.S. assets in support of the Rangers. I brought in U.S. artillery. I adjusted tactical air. I adjusted helicopter gunships, logistics support. Anything the U.S. could bring to bear, the advisor brought to bear for his unit. Uh, that was the principal role of advisors. You brought in the combat multipliers, in a sense. Exactly. Okay. Uh, your book examines a, a major combat operation in June of 1967 that involved that Ranger Battalion. Um, what led to that operation? What intel led you to participate in that operation, which we call Sui Long? Uh, you're basically giving a, an intro to my book. Uh, and I should put a little background in. When, when you read the book, you have to understand I wrote it uh, based on the reports we got from our returned prisoners of war from the VC, who told us basically what took place on the other side of the hill. That's the basis of the book. Uh, that now said, the action began when a Chuhoi, which was the title term we used for a VC that surrendered to the South or to the U.S. came in to the 11th Cav, which was just south of us a little bit in Swanlock, and said, uh, hey, I've just been on a work program. Uh, there's this company size base camp up near War Zone D, uh, and I can take you to it. Well, of course, this got the 11th Cav guys all excited. And so they picked up this prisoner, who in the book I call Mr. Who, uh, and went to the 18th Arvin headquarters in Swanlock and reported, you know, they brought in Who and what the report was. The South Vietnamese interrogated him, basically got the same story. So the division commander of the 18th, General Jai, uh, called in uh, all of the units of which the 52nd was part. And uh, they, it was clear at that point that the 18th Arvin had to do something because the uh, 11th Cav commander had basically deposited Fu and the, in, the information on Jai's lap. Well, Jai's plan was, okay, what we'll do is we'll make this a division operation, but it's going to be led by the 52nd. 
and who had a general idea of the location he was at. At that point, Major Hepp interrogated him quite intensely and got a pretty good picture and believed he was sincere. Uh, a operation took place uh, on the 23rd of June to move us out uh, to a area just south. This map shows you, uh, if you can look at this point right there, this is an oxbow in the Dong Nai River, which is about 30 kilometers north of Swang Walk. This was the designated base camp, as who described it, for this VC company, underlying company. Is this kind of show it a little bit better for at least for Yes, this shows you the basic uh, transit. We were in Swan Walk with the 18th Arvin. Uh, we were helicoptered uh, from there to an LZ about a mile and a half from this oxbow. And from there on, the battle was joined. Who was with us uh, throughout this operation? Uh, this LZ was rather small, uh, was made up of basically uh, dead and dying uh, <clears throat> elephant grass. You can see the nature of the terrain. This is war zone D. You can just see it in the outline of the river, Dong Nai in the rear. That is our LZ up there. And this is, I took this from the helicopter going into it. So you can see the nature of the terrain and how uh, dense and isolated it is. So you we land going in here against a, a VC company. This was allegedly uh, against a VC company, correct. Um, and then um, uh, you wind up getting into a little bit uh, larger operation than you thought you were going to get involved in. <laughs> Well, what happened, we, we moved in standard ranger formation, which is uh, two columns of two rifle companies each. Uh, the left column was uh, first and second company with uh, Major Hep and Captain Shine. Uh, the right column was third and fourth companies with uh, myself and my counterpart, uh, Captain Tote and Sergeant Swires. We moved about a mile and a half, and this is now about 1600, 1630 in the afternoon of the 24th. Uh, my side immediately had an engagement moving up. In fact, I fired on the first uh, VC guard that fired on us. And then at that point, everything just broke. There was just lots of noise, shooting, firing, uh, moving forward fast, fast, fast. And what we discovered immediately was we were in the middle of a VC base camp that was a whole lot larger than a company. Uh, you can see they had a series of trenches. These were ground level trenches, zigzag on the corners of each trench and in the center were oblique bunkers. And most of the bunkers had either a machine gun or a 51 caliber, which is a hellacious big bullet. And uh, Hep later on in the course of the discussion, leaping ahead a little bit, said he immediately saw that it was much bigger than, than uh, reported and probably a trap. And that the only solution he had was to attack into the base camp. That was the only survival mechanism he had. And he had really two reasons for that. One was, if we got in the trenches, we had a reasonable chance of fighting. Uh, if we tried to withdraw, a force of the apparent size would come around us and probably wipe us out uh, in this uh, dense terrain where you couldn't see anything and bring in any kind of support. The other thing, as he told us later, was this was an opportunity to attack and kill VC, and he was not going to lose that opportunity.
So he was sort of a pit bull. Once he once he sunk his teeth, then he absolutely. Wasn't... He was absolutely tenacious, and this was just part of his makeup. Uh, <clears throat> this is taken a couple days later. You can see the extent of destruction. At any rate, uh, by 1730 in the evening of the 24th, we were fully engaged. Uh, and in the evening, they closed in on both of our flanks. Uh, and then by six o'clock in the morning, they started pushing us very hard. Uh, during the course of the evening, we brought in 175 artillery, the only stuff that could actually range where we are, where we were. Uh, the problem is the 175 was firing at maximum range so that it's, uh, call it range, probable error was pretty marked. And finally, we had to turn it off because we were landing rounds in our own position, uh, which meant we had no support whatsoever. Uh, in the course of the evening, a dense fog rolled over that whole area. And under the cover of that fog, uh, they rafted over a little more than another regiment of troops into the narrow portion of the base camp that they still held and around on our flanks. Uh, understood that and with Captain Shine, who was doing most of the heavy lifting at that point, uh, Captain Shine arranged for a massive tactical airstrike sequence over the course uh, of the very early morning at first light. Uh, first light, which was about, oh, maybe 6 a.m., uh, we had some Charlie model gunships come in from the 11th Cav. Uh, I should mention... Talk, for, for those who may think of, of the Cobra, can you talk about what a Charlie model gunship looked like? Well, basically, it's a Huey with rockets and machine guns. Uh, the helicopter, the Huey is not designed to carry all that weight. Uh, so it was low and slow, but it did the job uh, under uh, controlled circumstances. Uh, you, can see, you, you can see by the previous picture how dense the jungle was. The only communication we had was with an L-19 uh, from Swan Lock that flew overhead that could talk to us through the dense canopy. Uh, the PRC-25s we had couldn't penetrate anywhere uh, beyond just straight up. Uh, and he kept us informed and engaged and actually gave us a great deal of personal confidence. We had a couple C-46 gunship spookies come in on the night. They couldn't see anything, so they couldn't really provide us any support. They couldn't see the Dong Nai, so they missed the regiment being rafted across. Uh, and once the gunships cleared, the first, uh, we were starting to get the first pressures and the uh, trench lines were becoming more and more compressed. At that point, Major Hep told the second company commander, Major uh, uh, Tiwi Tang, Lieutenant Tang, to pick up his company and assault into the VC assault. And that that would provide us the necessary distraction to allow us to pull out behind the uh, tactical air bomb line that Captain Shine had arranged. And that's basically exactly what happened is an incredible feat of courage. Uh, Tang, uh, picked up his company and they all assaulted directly into the base camp in the middle of the VC attacking us. Uh, and at that same time, just almost like Hollywood, the first tactical airstrike came in and it created a great big hole. It was a Canberra. I can remember it over my head right now. Uh, it's silver silhouette, silver aluminum silhouette with the bombs released over me. You can see the air brakes kick out, and it's just tre two tremendous explosions. And the fac overhead said, well, he said an expletive and said, there they are. They're all exposed. 
And at that point, the Charlie model came in and the gun, the tactical air at that point had basically wiped out a whole battalion that was assembled on our right flank. And had it actually assaulted, we'd have been wiped out. We had nothing at that position to clear it. Uh, the TAC air just hit it purely providentially. And for the first time, opened up the canopy. And at that point, they brought in 72 tactical air strikes in the course of 45 minutes. We went from bomb, line, from bomb crater to bomb crater with each drop pulling out our forces. Uh, we finally got back to the original LZ about 10.30 in the morning. And at that point, I did a quick uh, review of who was in the perimeter. I counted a total of 32 people. This is the LZ uh, where we were at. Uh, that, what was, uh, when you compare troop numbers, how many went in with the Rangers? That, that uh, we had about 450 going in. Uh, I had 32 counted in the perimeter at 1030, uh, with everybody being scattered and eventually found. We got about a total of 200 back of the total the 450. Uh, the rest how many were, enemy did you face? Uh, we faced what was estimated to be a reinforced main force regiment from the VC 5th Main Force Division. Uh, we went back uh, two days later uh, to the base camp with now the 11th ACR and the 5th Vietnamese Cavalry. You can see a picture, number, you look at 17. Yep. Uh, that's me in the base camp. Uh, this would be the 27th of uh, June. Uh, and you can see how blown away it was. You can see the troops in the background. We collected in the neighborhood of about pretty close to 500 bodies and parts, uh, which uh, we dropped into the uh, ditches and bulldozed over. Uh, so it was a, uh, you know, it was, it was a real meat grinder. I mean, we went back and there were bits and pieces all over the place, up in the trees and down on the ground, unidentifiable as to which side they were on. Uh, so it was pretty much of a mess. Um, the rest of the story is that uh, as, as indicated, we had a number of prisoners and I would say in our, uh, and also some unique escapes, uh, Lieutenant Tang got all the way over to the Dong Nai river, uh, it was basically separated from the rest of his company, got into the river and followed it down at night along the bank. And this is Tiwi Tang later, uh, <clears throat> down the bank and finally got down to near Highway 20, the, uh, the one of the main access points in that part of Vietnam, and presented himself almost buck naked uh, to an element of the cab and who brought him back to us. Uh, extraordinary uh, story. And the other one was an NCO, a, Viet a Ranger NCO that was found five days later by uh, a, a, a gunship crew from the 11th Cav that was flying over the general area, saw this guy standing in the middle of an open area waving his hands at him. They thought he was a VC, went down, saw he was nut, couldn't quite figure it out, landed. Was one of our Ranger sergeants who was carrying on his right shoulder a wounded buddy who was more, worse off than he was. Uh, both of them were barefoot and on his left shoulder, he had both of their uh, TA 50s and their weapons. And he was brought back by the, uh, the CAV to us. I mean, there, there's no better epitome of what a Ranger is all about than what that guy is. And by the way, he had a sucking chest wound uh, that the door gunner fixed with a 
uh, plastic wrap from a battery uh, on the way back. At any you rate, that, go you ahead. Said that, you said that uh, later on you found that the intel was all bad and, and uh, this was not what you expected when you walked into the operation. And later Correct. on you found stuff from returning uh, uh, prisoners or somebody? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, we had a number of uh, rangers taken prisoner. Eight of them were returned to us as a goodwill gesture, returned to the South Vietnamese as a goodwill gesture in December. And they were all shipped immediately to us in Swanlock. By that time, I was the senior advisor. Uh, Captain Shine had returned. Uh, Major Hep interrogated each one of them in my presence individually. He was highly suspicious of why they were returned and felt they had basically been flipped. Nonetheless, he, he interrogated them and independently, each of them said basically the same thing, that they were evacuated from the base camp where they were taken prisoner to a much larger base camp near the border, which was allegedly the Cosvin headquarters, central office of South Vietnam. Uh, one of the folks in that base camp being General Win Chi Tan, who is the head of Cosvin, essentially the General Westmoreland for the North Vietnamese. Uh, and that over the course of a couple of months, remember this is June, uh, as they were migrating around the countryside, uh, various officers in the VC or troops uh, would talk to them about what happened. And the story was this whole deal was a set up ambush. Uh, it was part of Ch uh, Tan's strategy uh, that they would, in 1967, make a specific target of the elite Vietnamese units as a morale-destroying activity. If the South Vietnamese could see that their airborne, their rangers, their marines, other like elements were being decimated, they would lose their uh, sense of enthusiasm and support and basically uh, flip to the north. This was the plan that uh, the prisoners were told that Tan had sold and that the 52nd simply by chance was the first unit uh, to be subjected to this. Uh, they talked about the B-52 strike which hit the base camp which I remember vividly because the, it was the ground was literally rolling a night later and you know knocked us off of our feet and they each independently told the same story about the base camp how the b-52 strike hit it how apparently Tan had been killed and they had to march all the way into laos uh, where they were picked up by where the body was picked up by a helicopter and moved back uh, all of which is obviously conjecture, but uh, all eight said it enough independently and with a lot of uh, detailed interrogation by HEP, it had a modicum of logic about it. So I took it essentially as a unproven fact, and that became much of the basis for the book, uh, simply because it showed the other side of the hill. They had a very well-planned ambush of the 11th Cav trying to rescue us because they knew the Cav could only come one way and they set it up. Uh, they knew the 18th was not going to come to our rescue. The 48th Regiment was a kilometer to our rear when we were locked in the base camp and refused to move the entire evening or next day. Uh, so it, it had a considerable logic to it. Uh, so, you know, that's the basis of the book, and I believe to this day it is essentially correct. What's your uh, most vivid memories of that action? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, one of them was Major Hep standing up. There were some troops that were starting to get uh, a little nervous and kind of slinking toward the rear. Hep stood up, all five feet four of him, immaculate uh, press, camouflage fatigue, spit shine boots, uh, swagger stick in one hand and his favorite Walther PPK in his left hand and pointed it at the troop and just quietly pointed the pistol at the troop and then where the troop was supposed to go. The troop got the message and went back to his position. Uh, you know, great example of combat leadership at the time. What other lessons did you draw that you took for the rest of your career from this action? I'm sorry, I restate that. What lessons did you take that affected the rest of your career from this specific action? Well, the first is there's, uh, there's no substitute for NCO quality uh, on the line and for officer quality when it is desperately needed. Uh, one of the things that Hep always made a point of with both Captain Shine and myself was to tell us what was going on in the midst of battle. You know, he would say, okay, this is what's going on. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what they're gonna do. And this is then what I'm gonna do. And he was invariably correct. And he did this under the most contentious of conditions and pressures. Uh, with Al at this action and with me in the middle of Tet uh, in, uh, you know, very difficult urban environment where we're getting overrun on several occasions. Uh, did, they do so this, did, he do this with, did he do this with his own officers, explain his, his plan and his logic? Yes, he was, he was, he was unlike most of the Vietnamese units that I saw, he was not uh, what you call uh, dictatorial without discussion. Uh, he would bring in his officers, explain them what was going on. They'd have a discussion and he'd make a clear decision and they'd move out. Uh, it was an inclusive process uh, within that cultural norm where just dictation from above and isolation was sort of the norm. He was not like that way at all. He was 100% engaged at every level. Um, you, you talked about the number of uh, casualties they took. How long did it take for this unit to recover? Because you talked about going back into combat for Tet. Yeah, uh, you know, we got back uh, to Swan Lock a couple of days later. Like we had maybe about 200 people total uh, bits and pieces would come in and then that was it. Well, what they then did to reconstitute us, uh, they moved us down to the to Trung Lap Ranger Training Center near Kuchi, south of Saigon, and brought in a whole bunch of replacements uh, to fill us up again. And then while we were at Trung Lap, uh, we did extensive training from both individual up to battalion. Uh, and we took a lot of casualties during that period. Uh, this was a very bad area, the Hobo Woods, Boiloy, uh, uh, lots of sniping, lots of booby traps. Uh, it was a really nasty place to be, particularly reconstituting, but at any rate, uh, after a little more than a month down there, we were shipped back to Swan Lock uh, to continue where we had left off. Were all these replacements volunteers or some of them were forced to go into the Rangers? Well, I, I think all of the above. Uh, I don't, I think at this stage of the game, no Vietnamese military age male was a volunteer per se, unless he could work his way into a friend's organization. Uh, I think most of them were impressed, uh, but I would all, and as I said, most of them were, you would call it the outcasts and dregs of Vietnamese society, uh, but they were extremely good soldiers. Um, is this from uh, this award ceremony that I popped up now, that, that you sent me this image of? Yes. Is this, is this operation or is this from a previous operation? No, no, this is the direct result of the, uh, 
uh, Sui Long operation. Uh, they held this ceremony about a week after the action. And uh, then Premier Win Cao Ki came up to award the unit the Vietnamese uh, Cross of Gallantry, which you see uh, him affixing to the battalion colors. Uh, and that on the right is Colonel Jai, who was the 18th Arvin commander. Uh, I would also say notable the uh, troop holding the fixed bayonet is the NCO that was recovered from, uh, the, that the CAV recovered. Uh, he still had a bandage around his inside over his chest but Hep insisted that he be present because of his demonstrated courage. Uh, and the lieutenant, which you can't see, just his arm there holding the battalion flag is uh, Lieutenant Tang. Um, you talked about, um, this is their government recognizing you, but you also talked about how U.S. units recognized uh, this 52nd Ranger Battalion. Why was that? Uh, well, I think <laughs> simply because of their performance. Uh, as a result of Sui Long, the battalion was submitted for and awarded a second presidential unit citation. Uh, this is on top of the first one that they were awarded uh, for the battle at Dong Swai. Uh, and it was a clear recognition uh, of the quality of the unit. Uh, the 11th Cav loved the Rangers and vice versa. Uh, every mission that the Cav went on in the uh, Long Khan province area, they asked for the 52nd. And the 52nd loved it because they were just basically an American unit. Uh, they got all the artillery they needed. They got medevacs. Uh, they knew if they were in trouble that the Cav was going to come get them. Uh, there was never a problem, and there were a lot of firefights the cab got into that the 52nd was instrumental in helping them bail out. Uh, they were the cab's light infantry, uh, and, you know, that, that maintained itself uh, until Tet, in which case, you know, everything became quite a bit different. I believe Captain Shine said sometimes they got some rather unusual gifts in recognition of their quality. <laughs> yes. Um, the uh, CAV commander, Colonel Cobb, uh, flew in one day uh, after actions with the 52nd and met Shine and Hep on the LZ, and he had his aides bring out. Uh, two big wooden crates, pulled out the crates, opened them up, and they were brand new M60 machine guns. Well, you could, the battalion, you know, was just ecstatic. Understanding to this point, the weapons that the 52nd had were the World War II cast-offs that we had. Uh, M1s, M1 carbines, uh, the 1917 light machine gun, quote unquote. Uh, these M60s were a huge morale boost to say nothing of firepower. Uh, and they were given to our best machine gunners, which were a couple of Moton Yard teams. Uh, and I can distinctly remember the Moton Yard gunner with his little pipe chewed in his mouth and his gold tooth working off just Fort Benning three round bursts uh, at the bad guys. And one of the VC officers was giving commands with a whistle and he keyed, the gunner keyed on the whistle, gave it a three round burst and you could distinctly hear the air getting sucked in instead of blown out. Uh, and you know, those gunners were, they were in hog heaven uh, with those machine guns. And, you know, it made a huge morale difference as the uh, later uh, issuance of the M16s did to us before Tet. Uh, you say you, uh, this was your first assignment, then you had a second assignment in Vietnam. Uh, when you went back, what had changed? 
Well, the whole army uh, had changed. Uh, the army that I saw, U.S. Army in 1967-68, was highly professional, good soldiers, good NCOs, good officers, aggressive, go out and get them mentality, and uh, real combat professionals. My second tour, which was 70-71, the Army, had, in my opinion, had totally changed. Uh, all the troops were risk adverse. They were people that couldn't draft the dodge, uh, could, could not dodge the draft. Uh, the officers were very risk adverse. Uh, they were just kind of hanging on. There was a lot of what I saw was very much self-serving. You know, I got to get a command, but I don't want to get anybody hurt. Then I can leave and check my block, that sort of thing. Uh, and it was just very disappointing to me because I still had a uh, modicum of idealism. Uh, I fought to be a rifle company commander in the 101st, which I got. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I found my senior officers, with the exception of one, uh, to be very lacking in what I thought was the purpose of, you know, why they were serving. Um, did you run into any of the, uh, the Rangers that you served with your first tour? Uh, I corresponded with Hep, uh, who by that time had become a Ranger group commander, actually up in I Corps. Uh, <clears throat> but beyond that, uh, no. Uh, I did go on leave once down into Saigon and went back to Swan Lock, but the battalion was no longer there. They had moved out to some other location with 5th Ranger Group uh, north of Saigon, so I did not uh, reconnect with them. Okay. What leadership lessons did you take from uh, your period with uh, the 52nd? Well, you know, again, the, the quality of a unit, it rests on the individual qual professional quality of the soldier itself. That's the core. Uh, and then the NCOs at the small unit, particularly the squad. Uh, if you have uh, NCOs at that level that know their job, you got a very solid unit. And then in times of crisis, moments of crisis, an officer standing up and becoming the sort of the symbol, the symbol of what they were supposed to be doing at that moment was crucial. Uh, officers have to be up front uh, when it gets really difficult. Uh, troops don't want to sell their soul for somebody on a radio. They want to see the person and know that they're there and they're taking part in the risk. Uh, and that's exactly what I learned from the NCOs in the 82nd earlier, and certainly from General Gavin and all of his discussions with us, uh, you know, prior, both prior and after uh, my Vietnam tours. Before this interview, you mentioned something about HEP being non-doctrinal, that he sometimes he would violate doctrine to a better effect. Yes. Uh, HEP probably had a better sense of what needed to be done uh, on a moment in time than most everybody else did. Uh, at Dong Swai, for an example, uh, he took over from the battalion commander who was drunk and could not lead the battalion. He was the EXO. So he went in there to the initial planning meeting basically with a mentality, hey, I'm the commander, I'm going to make a decision here as to how to employ the command. Well, the both the Vietnamese and the U.S. wanted him to land about four miles away and march into Dong Swai. He said, that's crazy. They're going to ambush us along the way. We'll never get there. I demand that we land right on top of Dong Swai. Well, they fought him. They tried to get him to change his mind. He refused. And it was then up to the helicopter lift units as to what they were going to do. And they said, hey, if he wants to do it, we're willing to do it. So contrary to everything that 
uh, the leadership, U.S. and Vietnamese, wanted him to do. He landed dead on top of the objective and succeeded uh, well beyond what anybody thought. And oh, by the way, learned later from VC prisoners that had he landed where he was, his prediction of being ambushed would be exactly correct. They already had a unit there waiting for the logical approach to it. Uh, he did the same thing uh, in assisting the 11th ACR. Their second squadron was ambushed up near uh, on Highway 20. Uh, and again, Ranger Light Infantry for the CAV, he said, put us right on top of the ambush, which uh, they did. And he rolled them up and cleaned them out uh, at much less casualties than had he taken the more conventional approach. Uh, for the rest of your career, did you take some of his attitudes about doctrine uh, in your operations? Uh, yes, I mean, you know, doctrine is something to be studied. It's sort of like, you know, what's the difference between a statute and a regulation? You know, a regulation is kind of guidance, a statute's law. Uh, doctrine is uh, regulatory in nature. Uh, you have to judge it against the facts of the moment and your own gut instinct and then, you know, follow it. And, you know, I, I certainly did that through several times in my career. You, ha um, you have to be capable of judgmentally disobeying uh, what is the correct way to do things. Uh, if in your judgment, that's the most effective and efficient solution. Okay. Um, end of the war. What happened to some of the leaders of this battalion that you, uh, you served with? Well, um, the real story is Hep. Uh, he uh, was a Ranger Group Commander in I Corps. Uh, at the fall of Vietnam in 1975. Uh, and he, his unit, his group fought to the very end. They only surrendered like a day or two after the formal surrender had taken place in Saigon. Uh, he was immediately sequestered and sent to a re-education camp, quote unquote. Uh, he absolutely refused to acquiesce to the uh, positions and philo philosophy of the re-educators. Uh, he would not bend or compromise. Uh, he was totally resistive uh, to the point where the camp just, the camp leadership just finally got tired of having to deal with him because he was undermining their efforts with the other members of the uh, South Vietnamese that were supposedly being rehabilitated, he was stiffening them up. Uh, and finally, one day, uh, a guard just hit him over the head with a rifle and shot him. Uh, and that was the end of him. Uh, later on, his wife and uh, children uh, managed to evacuate to the States. Uh, the Wife now lives in a nunnery, there were Catholics, uh, in Baltimore, and uh, the kids are doing great as U.S. citizens, as virtually all the Vietnamese refugees are. Um, what else would you like to say about uh, this day in Vietnam? Um, I think it, number one is I actually believe it to be true. Uh, there is, you know, a certain degree of hypotheses, but I think it's based on pretty solid fact. Uh, one thing I would ask people to take away is that the, a lot of South Vietnamese units were very, very good. They gave 110% all, all the time. Uh, they were unnecessarily maligned by uh, our media. Uh, they tried to fight to the very end as best we taught them. We pulled the rug out from underneath them. Uh, and it was, I think, a real disgrace 
Uh, you know, it's both, I, I could say that Vietnam is both the high and the low point of my military career. But they're, they're good people that did well, and I'm very glad I had the experience. Well, thanks, sir. Is there anything else you'd like to add at the end? Uh, no, I just hope people uh, took, this, took away from it with an open mind and maybe learned a couple of things uh, they didn't know before. Okay.